This is Kevin Wood. I am um, doing my third video on last things. And uh, if you'd like to email with me with reference to this particular video, you can email me at kwood50322 at gmail.com. I have two other videos that are on YouTube. One is uh, called Last Things 1 and the other one is Last Things 2. And this will be Last Things 3. And uh, you can find those simply by uh, Googling Kevin Wood. Uh, last when you get on YouTube uh, just by putting it in the search bar there and uh, do Kevin Wood last things one Kevin Wood last things two etc and I'm going to have eight chapters to this video series so uh, anyway if you want to do the entire series just uh, keep uh, get to YouTube and, and do the search in the search bar there so today we're going to focus on uh, Jesus and from my perspective, the obvious personage or um, character or uh, person we really want to focus on whenever we talk about es eschatology is Jesus. And it seems kind of odd that I would even start there because too many people seem not interested in Jesus. They, they go straight to the Antichrist or they go straight to 666 or they go straight to some kind of a chronology that they heard some preacher give 30 years ago or 20 years ago or what have you. And, and they skip over the, 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 the primary uh, importance of Jesus in last days. In fact, there are no last things. There is no eschatology without Christology. And uh, so we're going to start with Christ. We're going to talk about him. We're going to talk about why uh, Jesus is going to come again, the purposes for his second coming. And uh, we're going to kind of uh, discuss a few other things as we go along. But nonetheless, that's the nature of this lesson today. And I would just say this, any uh, last things teacher or a person who is preaching or teaching on eschatology that gets lost in um, the Antichrist or demonology or gets lost in some kind of a, a, a dispensational approach where they've got all of these charts and graphs about uh, when things will occur. You know, I, I would stay clear of those guys uh, because that's it misses the main point of the last things, which is all about Jesus. And by the way, there are a lot of good guys out there that, that focus on that. I just wish there were more. And for instance, it's impossible for you to read the book of Revelation without seeing that this book is all about Jesus. And, and really the time and the space given to the evil characters that you're going to start seeing there, uh, let's say in chapter 12, 13, it's very limited. And uh, but the amount of time that you get in the book of Revelation with regard to Jesus, well, that's spectacular. It's all about him. And the book of Revelation rightfully could be said to be a book of worship, a worship book about Jesus. And, and so that's what we're going to focus on. And today we're going to start with a passage from the book of Revelation, chapter 5. And we're going to read verses 11 and 12. So let me just read those real quick. Revelation 5, 11 through 12. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders in a loud voice. They were saying, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. And so you wonder why I say the book of Revelation is a worship book. Well, right there, Revelation chapter five, where all, all of these um, supernatural beings gather around the throne throne, and they worship Jesus or the lamb. And uh, so if you want to know what you're going to be doing in the last days, well, one of the things that's going to dominate uh, our existence in the last days is we're going to be gathered around the throne and we're going to be worshiping the lamb who was slain and because he's earned that right. So today I'm going to just give you seven quick reasons why the second coming is all about Jesus and his purpose, seven reasons for Jesus uh, to return again. And I'll give you some scripture passages that you can look up at your leisure. And uh, I would just say, I would do that, you know, go back and, and uh, if you have any questions or if you think I'm going a bit fast through this series, go back and study the scripture passages that I've given you because it'll give you a deeper understanding of what I'm thinking in terms of eschatology and last things. So, so today, seven purposes for the second coming of Jesus. Number one, Jesus comes to claim his bride. And you have passages late in the book of Revelation, but the one I'm going to use here is Ephesians chapter 5, 25 through 27. Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. 
And uh, so you can read that passage. It's all about uh, how Jesus views the church as his bride and how he's, he's even actively working to prepare his bride to be ready for his coming. Uh, and uh, I would just say this uh, as a preview of the chapter that I'm going to do on the rapture. Uh, my belief is that uh, the rapture is simultaneous with the second coming of Christ. In other words, it's not a separate event from the second coming of Christ, as some people would have you believe. But I, I'm going to have a whole chapter on the rapture, so we'll get to, to that down the road. However, why am I talking about the rapture? Because any teaching, I'm not just talking about the rapture, I'm talking about any eschatology that promises that the church will escape tribulation, trial, or trouble, and have no pain or suffering, which is, of course, what some proponents of the rapture propose, I'm going to reject that. At least in part, what it means to be the bride of Christ is the bride of Christ will be made ready through uh, the trial and the tribulation. If you wonder what's the purpose of the last days, what is the purpose of the, the coming age of troubles that you're going to find in Matthew chapter 24? Well, at least part of that reason is to make the church ready as the bride of Christ. And any viewer eschatology which seeks to circumvent that process, I've got real problems with it. And we'll talk about that when we get to the concept, the idea of whether the rapture is actually a separate event. And uh, so that's down the road. First here, Jesus comes to claim his bride, the church, Ephesians chapter 5, 25 through 27. Jesus comes to rule, Psalm 110. And if you want to talk about a fantastic passage in scripture, which doesn't get enough attention, read the 110th Psalm. Because the 110th Psalm kind of gives you this, it unpacks this whole eschatological reason for the return of Jesus, uh, for uh, God to come and, and set things right and to rule and to put his enemies uh, in the place where they belong. And so I would just recommend that, that you read the 110th Psalm and get this picture that Jesus comes to rule. And it, this goes along with the third point, which is Jesus comes to judge or to bring justice. And you can read Acts chapter 10, 42. Uh, Paul makes this clear in his writings that, that the earth is groaning uh, for the second coming of Jesus, for a cessation of the, the troubles. And uh, one, Jesus, one reason Jesus is going to come back is he's going to come back and rule and he's going to come back and set things straight. And uh, we definitely live in a world where things need to be set straight. Uh, as I do this video, we are just... Uh, coming out of the whole COVID-19 scare, which I think was radically overstated and scared many, many Americans into not going to church and not, not following through on many of their life disciplines. And uh, perhaps that was a purpose of that whole COVID-19 scare. Uh, I don't know. It was a time of trouble and a time of tribulation. And even now, uh, Minneapolis is burning through another wave of race riots and uh, that are similar to what took place in in Ferguson five or six years ago in Ferguson, Missouri. And again, events like this and, and what's going on with uh, General Flynn underscore the fact that we as a people yearn for the second coming of Christ so that he can set things right. He can rule. And uh, when he rules, he's going to bring his brand of justice, which is nothing like the justice that we've had uh, on this in our lifetime. And, and we look forward to his coming. Uh, it's been my experience as a pastor that you're going to have some people that are afraid of the last things and last days. And uh, if you were to bring up the topic of last things, some people, it's kind of like talking about religion and politics. You don't do it in, in polite company because people don't want to think about the tribulation or, you know, uh, Jesus returning because it's going to change their world. It's going to turn things on their head. Uh, C.S. Lewis offers a different perspective on that and his yearning. And when he writes about uh, the return of Christ or the eschaton, uh, it's all about Jesus coming and, and making things right and uh, justice being set forth. And uh, as a believer in Christ Jesus, I can't wait for the day when things are set right, when Jesus rules and when justice is brought. And I want to be a part of his bride, the church. It's going to be ready, prepared, even if that means tribulation and trial and trouble for his second coming. Number four, Jesus comes to confront evil and demonic forces. Uh, you can read all about this in Matthew chapter 24, 25. Uh, let me say this, that I'm a supernaturalist. Uh, I believe in 
the workings of God in miraculous ways. Even though I'm not a Pentecostalist, I'm a supernaturalist. I believe God does powerful, miraculous things in uh, this world because he's God. He can do whatever he wants to. Uh, we could hearken back to early Luke where it says, with God, nothing is impossible. God can do whatever he wants to because he's God. In the last days, miraculous things, of miraculous acts of, of the Lord are going to be prevalent, but also there are going to be the workings of the demonic and evil forces, and these also will escalate in the last days. And uh, so Jesus is going to come, and one reason he's going to come is because, and this is made clear in Matthew chapter 24, is because if he didn't, uh, time would run out on his church. Time would run out on, on his people if those days weren't shortened. And uh, so Jesus comes back to overcome the rampaging effect of out-of-control demonic forces led by the, the lead demon himself, the fallen angel, Satan, who seeks to, to uh, kill and destroy everything that he sets his, uh, his eyes, his vision on. And uh, that includes you and me, the church, and not just us, but innocent uh, people around the globe. The, this gives him pleasure and joy to destroy everything. And uh, so those days are going to be shortened. And uh, Jesus is going to return to bring justice, to rule, to claim his bride, and also to destroy, utterly destroy, to take on the forces of, of the demonic and to take on uh, the forces of Satan. Number, <coughs> number five, Jesus comes to establish a new Jerusalem. Uh, Jesus ultimately is, um, I, I would recommend Michael Heiser at this point. Uh, his book, Unseen World, Unseen Realm, I think that's the name of that book. Uh, Jesus wants to reestablish God's presence on earth. And whenever the fall took place early in the book of Genesis, you know, sin and, and, and Satan in and the, and the garden, the serpent, you know, and the eating of the fruit, forbidden fruit, all that. You guys remember that story. Nonetheless, it's been God's design and purpose to rule on earth ever since, to reestablish the, the, that intimate relationship he had with Adam and Eve. He wants to do that. That's the purpose of, of the new Jerusalem or God coming down to rule with us, to be with us, to wipe away every tear from their eyes. And I hope you are like uh, like me, like, and you look forward to the day when Jesus will rule from the, his new Jerusalem and he'll be a present with us forever. Number six, Jesus comes to fulfill his word. Matthew 24, 35. I would just add this about this particular one. Jesus has said he's going to return. Look at uh, early in the book of Acts uh, where the angels are talking to the disciples and they say, why are you looking at the sky? He says, in the same manner that he departed, he will return in that same manner. Uh, I would, uh, Michael Heiser talks about this and he calls Jesus the cloud rider. And Jesus is going to be a cloud rider. He's going to return in the clouds. In the same manner that he left, he will return. And uh, when he returns, he's going to do all of the things I've been talking about in this video. He is the main character of the eschaton. He's going to set things right. He's going to judge and rule, and he's going to come and claim his bride. He's going to establish a new Jerusalem. He's going to overcome the, the forces of evil and demonic that are so prevalent out there. And I hope you're ready. Uh, in fact, I, you need to know Jesus, because if these days indeed are close, uh, that's your guarantee. You need to know who Jesus is. And by the way, I'm not talking about some kind of pie-in-the-sky concept escapism. The, the people who would uh, offer that kind of criticism are shallow and, and they don't understand Christianity. We're not talking about some kind of escapism. And that's, another, that's one reason why I have, that's another reason I have a problem with the concept of the rapture is it is a form of escapism. Uh, those of us who are believers in the last days, we have the great and wonderful privilege during one of the most horrendous periods of tribulation and trial this planet has ever known to set forth the glories of our Lord Jesus Christ and to be grateful believers in him. And uh, so there's no escape from that. Don't seek to escape. In fact, embrace the possibility that we might live in the last days. Em embrace the possibility it may not be pleasant. Embrace the possibility that God is going to make his church fit through trial and tribulation. Embrace the possibility it will not last forever. So he comes to fulfill his word. He's told us he's going to return. I believe he's going to return. Uh, I'm satisfied with that in the same manner that he left. Acts chapter, I think that's chapter two in the book of Acts. Uh, and then finally, seven, Jesus will come again 
to give his people a forever home. And I would just have you, rec- I would recommend you read John chapter 14. And his disciples, Jesus is talking about departing. And he said, don't worry. If I go, I've gone to prepare a place for you. And if I've gone to prepare a place for you, I'll come and I will bring you with me. Jesus has gone to prepare a place for us. He's gone to make us our forever home. And he will return to take us with him. That is his promise. And when he comes back, he's taking us with him. And as I said earlier, that my concept, my reading of the New Testament is there is no separate event of rapture and the second coming of Christ. Christ will come back and those of us who are alive in Christ will meet him in the air. And if you want to call that rapture, more power to you. And when we meet him in the air, then we will be changed in, in an instant. This is what Paul says in, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to meet him. He's going to take us to be with him in his forever home. We're going to be a part of his defeating ultimately uh, Satan at the and, and evil and demonic forces at the Battle of Armageddon. It's all going to be great and wonderful and, and many, many people. Don't get me wrong. Many, many people will suffer. Uh, my concept, my understanding of the last days, the tribulation, it'll make the Holocaust seem small. Many, many people, believers, will groan under the weight of that persecution. However, that being said, the Bible makes it clear those who are dead in Christ will rise first. The Bible makes it clear those of us who are yet alive will meet him in the air. God is going to take care of us and he will take us to our forever home. And there is one proviso and I will finish with this. The one proviso is that you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You see, eschatology or the study of last things is all about Jesus. And it doesn't do you any good to think about the Antichrist or 666 or some kind of uh, chronology of the last days, the church age, the rapture, this happens, that happens. All that's ridiculous. You know what you need to do? You need to to have your passport, your ticket needs to be uh, uh, stamped. And, uh, And the way you do that is by embracing Jesus as your Lord and Savior because there is no other name under heaven by which a man may be saved. You have to know Jesus as your savior. And so if eschatology is all about Jesus, well, your salvation is all about Jesus. You need to know him today. So this lesson is where eschatology starts. It starts with Jesus because he is the beginning, the alpha, he's the end, the omega. And whenever we read the book of Revelation, it's all about worshiping him. And so the last days, the main character, the uh, protagonist, if you will, the one that we're going to focus on, it's all about Jesus. Thank you.